hypotenosis is also known as Kaplan with a C, Kaplan syndrome. So that's an important pathologic uh, consideration. Now let me remind you that all of us are exposed to carbon just by breathing in the pollution from the air if you happen to be in a big city. Um, and mild exposure of carbon occurs constantly, especially, especially because of that pollution. If it's mild, it doesn't really do anything. It sort of builds up in the macrophages. And so when you have buildup of um, carbon within the macrophages, that's called anthracosis. And examiners like you to know that. So you can have anthracosis within the macrophages of the lung and within the hilar lymph nodes. Um, again, that is, is clinically not significant but it is common among the vast majority of people because the vast majority of people are exposed to pollutants within the air. All right, so that's co-workers pneumoconiosis and have also in this context explained anthracosis. The next of the uh, pneumoconiosis is silicosis and in silicosis the idea is that there's exposure to silica. Now silica can occur if their patient's a silica miner. It occurs for example in sandblasters. There's silica in sand and sandblasters are people that take sand and shoot it at, the, at brick at a very, very high pressure with the idea that the friction created by the shooting of sand against brick will actually clean the brick. So it's a mechanism used to clean the surface of buildings. Uh, and so a sand blaster, quote unquote, could actually get exposed to silica as well. Now, one important thing about silica, if you remember this, you're done. And that is that when silica gets in the macrophages, it impairs the phagolysosomes to form. The, phag the phagosome is the vesicle that's generated when macrophages eat to kill something. And the lysosome is where the, where the phagosome merges in order to be able to destroy that thing. So what happens in this particular um, situation of silicosis is that it gets, the silica gets into the macrophages and impairs the formation of the phagolysosomes. Why is that important? Because it's the only pneumoconiosis, and this is the high yield point. It is the only pneumoconiosis that increases your risk for TB. Now, once you know that it increases your risk for TB, then you're also going to know where, it's, where, it's commonly, uh, where it commonly occurs within the lung, and it results in fibrotic nodules, usually in the upper lobe of the lung. So I use uh, silicosis and its relationship with TB to also remind me that these patients are going to have fibrotic nodules in the upper lobe of the lung. The next of the uh, pneumoconiosis is beryllium, and beryllium can be seen in minors. It can also be seen in workers in the aerospace industry. Now the idea with beryllium is that it results in non-caseating granulomas in the lung, in the hilar lymph nodes, and in other parts of the body, in other systemic organs. Now guess what that sounds like? Non-caseating granulomas in the lung, in the hilar lymph nodes, and systemic organs. It sounds exactly like sarcoidosis. And it is kind of very similar to sarcoidosis. However, in this particular case, this is driven by beryllium. So this is what I call the knee-jerk questions on, uh, on examinations where they give you a classic history and you think that this is just sort of a slam dunk question and so you quickly pick sarcoidosis but actually they were hinting at beryllium. So if they tell you that the patient works for NASA or recently designed some sort of stealth fighter or something like that, uh, then that would be a hint to you that maybe they're in the aerospace industry and so you want to think twice about beryllium. Another important thing about beryllium, it increases the risk for lung cancer. But I would say the highest yield is that you get these non-caseating granulomas in the lung, in the hilar lymph nodes, and in other organs. The final um, pneumoconiosis that we want to discuss is asbestos. Now, asbestos fibers would be seen in people who are con uh, classically construction workers. It was used in construction at one time. Plumbers, it was classically used at one time to, uh, to insulate pipes. And shipyard workers, where, where there used to be a classic exposure as well. Now, in each of these cases, the patient would get exposed to asbestos fibers, and what's important to know is asbestos does a couple things. It, does, it creates fibrosis in the lung or fibrosis in the pleura, or cancer in the lung or cancer in the pleura. That's my little way of remembering this. Fibrosis of the lung, fibrosis of the pleura, cancer of the lung, cancer of the pleura. So if you get um, cancer of the lung, that's the standard lung cancer, and it can also cause cancer of the pleura, and remember that cancer of the pleura is called mesothelioma. Now there is a high yield association, which I've already talked about in your neoplasia lectures, and that is patients who are exposed to asbestos are much more likely to get lung cancer, much more likely to get lung cancer than they are to get mesothelioma. And I've written that here just to remind you because it is so high yield. When patients have exposure to asbestos, it requires a confirmation, and the way by which we can make that confirmation is we can pathologically look for something called asbestos bodies. And asbestos bodies basically look like this. You get this long rod-shaped 
a particle which classically has little brown beads on it and these little brown beads they represent iron so there's iron depositing on this rod and this is also called a ferruginous body and so that's another uh, name for um, this particular particle but essentially this represents asbestos within the patient and so that's a pathologic way by which we can confirm the fact that the patient is exposed to asbestos so those are the four pneumoconioses and I've told you what I think to be the highest yield for each of those individual pneumoconioses Sarcoidosis is another disease that can result in granulomas within the interstitium of the lung, and those granulomas would result in restricted filling of the lung. Remember that sarcoidosis is a systemic disease characterized by non-caseating granulomas in multiple organs. Uh, the most commonly involved organs would be the lung and the hilar lymph nodes, as I'll highlight momentarily. Classically seen in African American females, we don't know what causes it. It's probably some unknown antigen with a CD4 positive helper T cell response. Here's what the granulomas look like. Um, here I've illustrated for you, this is the lung, there's an airspace here, and then you've got this pink region here of epithelioid histiocytes. Remember that the defining cell of a granuloma is an epithelioid histiocyte. In addition, you have some of the characteristic cells, for example, these giant cells. So this is the classic granuloma. It's non-caseating, uh, which means that all of the cells present within the granuloma are alive. There is no necrosis. One of the characteristic findings that can be seen in the granulomas of sar sarcoidosis is something called an asteroid body, and this is what we mean by an asteroid body. It's, a, it's just a funny configuration of some of the giant cells, and um, it's one of the characteristic findings in sarcoidosis as well. The granulomas, as I've said, they most commonly involve the hilar lymph node in the lung. Involvement of the lung is going to then create... Um, it's going to create an interstitial problem, and that interstitial problem will, res will lead to a restrictive lung disease. Basically, the, the lung becomes less compliant due to all of the granulomas present within the interstitium. Of course, the granulomas can involve multiple organs as well. So if it involves the eye, you get uveitis. If it involves the skin, you can get cutaneous nodules. It can involve the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands, so it can mimic Sjogren's syndrome, and this is very important because, again, it's sort of the knee-jerk questions that show up on exams. They expect you to, expect you to jump for Sjogren's syndrome, but actually they, they're talking about something different, and in this case they're talking about sarcoidosis. So just remember that it can involve the salivary glands and lacrimal glands, giving you the classic, Doc, I can't chew a cracker, cracker and there's dirt in my eyes, and an increased risk of dental caries. Those are the classic clinical findings in uh, Sjogren's syndrome. And so you could actually do a biopsy and see non-caseating granulomas. And if you have non-caseating granulomas with those symptoms, that is sarcoidosis. More, it, that's classic for sarcoidosis, I should say. And again, any tissue can, almost any tissue can really be involved. I've just told you a couple of the high yield associations. Now, the way that these patients present is the most common sign is cough but they can also have shortness of breath due to that um, restrictive lung disease that's going to be created by, by the sarcoid. Um, another very important finding is an elevated serum ACE. This is classically seen, so the angiotensin converting enzyme can be elevated in the blood. The patients have hypercalcemia. This is important. They like to ask you why. So the hypercalcemia occurs because the granulomas have one alpha hydroxylase activity and they can activate vitamin D. Now, Although we classically apply this to sarcoid and say because they're activating vitamin D, that there's going to be hypercalcemia in any disease in which the patients have a ton of non-caseating granulomas, for example, there will be activity, ex excess activity of the 1-alpha hydroxylase, which will then result in the production of hypercalcemia. So, for example, if a patient was exposed to beryllium and developed a very similar picture to sarcoid, and they also have hypercalcemia, that's okay, because it's the non-caseating granuloma that actually has the alpha-1 hydroxylase activity that's resulting in that um, hypercalcemia. The treatment is steroids, but what's interesting is that often this disease will resolve spontaneously without treatment. The final restrictive disease is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And the idea here is that a patient gets exposed to some sort of inhaled organic antigen. It could be, for example, the feces of a bird or sometimes feathers, etc. And that results in a granulomatous reaction to that antigen. Now, when there's a granulomatous reaction to that antigen, the patients will present with fever and cough and shortness of breath, usually hours after the exposure. And this will all resolve if you remove the exposure. Now, the initial consequence of being exposed is that the patient gets fever, cough, shortness of breath, and then they move away and they get better. 
However, if the patient is constantly exposed, then that would result in a interstitial fibrosis. And that's why we're talking about it in this particular section of your text. Now, so some examples, pigeon breeders lung, if a patient is breeding pigeons, for example. But what's important to note is that you get a granulomatous reaction in the lung. Now, in this case, you're going to get a granulomatous reaction, but what's going to be associated with the granulomatous reaction? Eosinophils. Again, it is a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So classically on the slide, you would see granulomas with eosinophils. So that's the end of that section, and we're going to move on to pulmonary hypertension in the next section.